Oh, okay, got it. All right. Yeah. Oh, okay, so we're a little early, we're early for the YouTube side, so I don't know, I guess they'll hear us. I don't think you can pull that down. No, we're well, 659, so. Okay, yeah. I will then go ahead. Okay, so we're a little early, we're early. I'm just gonna go ahead and broadcast, just more letting people in the room. Um, YouTube side can hear us already for the, re just FYI. Um, and I will just see how many go in the room and we'll kind of go from there. And Tim, I'll mention when you should pull down your presentation. Okay, hi students, this is Kathleen and I'm here to make sure that Zoom runs smoothly for you today. Thanks again for taking the time to be with us. We'll be getting started uh, very shortly. We're just giving a moment for everyone to come into the room. And in the meantime, uh, for our attendees, you probably see a chat icon. If you click on it in the to field, can you hit the drop down and select all panelists and attendees? That way other attendees can see your messages. It helps connect any responses we get from our panelists here. I will go ahead and say hello just really quick. And if you guys just don't mind, type in there. Let us know where you're from, where you're joining, how your holiday weekend was. And we'll be getting started really soon. Okay, Hector, are you okay if actually, go ahead, Tim, go ahead, take down the sign. And Hector, I'm gonna start recording, is that okay? Yep. Okay, go ahead and give it five seconds and you're welcome to take it away. Hello everybody and welcome to our event this evening. My name is Hector Verdugo. I am the Senior Vice President of Admissions here for Academy of Art University here in San Francisco, California, USA. Uh, first thing I wanna do is just go ahead and point out the chat feature. It looks like the chat is already going crazy. Uh, looks like we have ooh, about 150 people and climbing, entering into the room at the same time. Uh, just take a look. If you're just entering in right now, just look over the chat button. Make sure that when you click on chat, it's gonna give you the option of who you wanna to chat to please make sure you click all panelists and attendees. We're gonna to try to make this as fun as possible tonight. We wanna to make sure that we're interacting with you and we're answering your questions. So that's gonna be our forum so that we can take your questions and make sure that we get to everything. We're gonna be covering a lot of cool stuff tonight. So if you don't mind in the chat, just uh, let me know where you're from here so I can give some shout outs. I see, uh, uh, I have, uh, Ackley in Miami and LA, what's going on out there? I see, Colleen in New York City out there. I see the Bay Area, Jesse from Orange County. Thanks for being here tonight. Colorado, Olympia, Washington. Thanks for being here. Andrew, Crystal from Houston's here. New York City, we have Jamaica in the house tonight. Jamaica's here. Bethany, thank you for being here. Alexandria in Los Angeles is here. Mary from Virginia. A couple people from Miami. Manuel, hola out there in Tijuana. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. San Diego is in the house. Las Vegas is in the house tonight with Lance. Santa Cruz, New York City. We have Pittsburgh, Katie out there. We have New Delhi in the house. Thanks for being here, Reed. And I see uh, Najin in Iran. Hey, Chaturi, Hubide. Thank you for being here. Atlanta, Georgia's in the house. So tons of people. Mexico, how you doing out there? Oklahoma City. So anyway, just want to make sure I give some shout outs as people are coming in. Once again, if you have not, Make sure that you adjust your chat so that we can communicate with you. Hey, out there in Ecuador, I see you out there. All right, so as always, what I wanna do is I wanna take a quick second to promote our upcoming events. Tomorrow, we're also going to be hosting a workshop here through the uh, School of Entertainment. We're gonna be focusing on acting. If everybody can take a quick second and pause on the chat, I'm gonna go ahead and put this link in here for everybody. That link right there is for tomorrow, 5 p.m., you can RSVP for a workshop that'll be focused on acting. Once again, this is gonna be live. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So make sure that you go on there and you can RSVP to attend for tomorrow. And then last but not least, I wanna make sure that I'm also, uh, next Tuesday, we'll be uh, hosting another live workshop. This is gonna be focused on industrial design. 
So even if you have no interest in industrial design, if you want to learn how cars are made, toy design, product development, that type of stuff, we'll have a cool live workshop on that. Should be a lot of fun. So please feel free to RSVP and join us. So moving forward, what I want to do is this. I'm going to cut straight to it. We have a huge all-star cast here tonight, and we have a lot of people to introduce. So I just want to get to it really quickly and make sure I can pass this off to our stars of the show tonight. So just first leading off with our executive director of the Schools of Entertainment, uh, we're going to have Janice Sue Memel. She's going to be more or less our quarterback and our host tonight that's going to be facilitating all through uh, all through the event tonight. So you'll be the one, you'll, you'll be uh, hearing from her quite a bit. Uh, a little bit about Jenna. Uh, she's produced more than 25 feature films and over 80 live action shorts. Her work has won three Oscars, multiple Emmys, Writers Guild and Directors Guild Awards. And as the executive director, Jenna really brings a lot of wealth of talent and expertise to mentor students that are interested in careers in the film and entertainment industry. So Jana's going to be our star of the show tonight. We also have Melissa Seidman. She's our academic VP of the Schools of Entertainment. She's going to be helping us out uh, as an actress tonight, I believe. We have Ken Farrow in the house tonight. So Ken has worked in the motion picture industry for over 30 years. He's best known for the ultra high speed work on the Clio award-winning work on Sony Bravia Super Bowl spot in which 750,000 Super Bowls were launched over the city of San Francisco. Having lensed many commercials and music videos and operated countless film and television shows, he's worked with directors like Sidney LeMay and Robert Town, and actors like Paul Newman, George Clooney, Michelle Pfeiffer, Claire Danes, and many others. We also have Bruce Finn tonight. So Bruce Finn is an Emmy Award winner. Bruce uh, Finn, he um, is credited as the director of photography on more than 100 major television network episodes and pilots. His work on some of the world's most famous holograms include work on Michael Jackson's hologram for Slave to the Rhythm. We also have Rich Castillo tonight. So Rich has been a director of photography shooting for Apple, Microsoft, and other corporate high-tech companies. Rich is also a Steadicam operator and has shot several one-take music videos. He's been an instructor of cinematography and lighting for the Academy of Art University in both the film department and the visual effects department since 2005. And last but not least, we have Chris Boxell, uh, who spent decades in the art department as a set decorator and production designer for feature films, TV shows, and other media. Among the shows you may have seen are Bull Durham, James and the Giant Peach, Bee Season, Fruitvale Station, and Blue Jasmine. She teaches at the Academy of Art and leads the production design track. Uh, many of her graduates are working professionals in the art, de and art departments on a variety of different productions. So as you can see, we have an all-star cast out there. Uh, I'm really happy that all of you are out here. There's well over 200 people on here right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and be quiet. You'll see me in the chat. I'll be here to answer your questions and make sure that I interact with you and help you out. And I'm gonna pass this over here to our star of the show, Ms. Janice Tumemo. So I'll see you in the chat, everybody. Thank you. Hey, welcome. Thank you all for coming. We're gonna spend a brief five minutes just telling those of you who don't know a little bit about the schools of entertainment. And then we're gonna move straight into some cine work then production design, then more cine work. So first we'll do our little schools of entertainment um, presentation. So I have to share for you all. And here we go. Um, I'm hoping you all can see my screen. Pictures up and action. I think AAU has a lot of great opportunities for filmmakers to explore what they're capable of. I think the students at AAU really 
close to the industry, and then they can attach it um, uh, after they graduate. Don't do that. Stop here. Every single professor I've had has been just like a pool of knowledge. Work with teachers who are professionals in the industry really makes you feel confident and like you can go out there and do it on a real set. But then we should do three colors. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The so AD cool. never leaves. Okay, I know. The AD never leaves. Oh, like if you, you know, so that if you bring him forward into this kind of close-up where he notices much more promising than that much. <laughs> guys, I don't, whoa, guys, where'd you go? So that's a little bit of presentation about what goes on in our summer web series mostly and on our student thesis films. So everybody who comes to AAU as an undergrad takes the same nine courses at the beginning of their career. And the reason we do that is we want to give you a taste of every aspect of filmmaking. So even if you were to come as wanting to be a cinematographer, or production designer, we want to make sure that you don't end up finding you love editing or sound more. So you take writing, editing, producing, cinematography, sound, directing actors, you get to try everything. And then you make your decision. Now at AAU, we have five working sound stages. These are the same kind of sound stages you have in a movie studio. And these get dressed, and Chris is going to talk about that. We have an entire dressing warehouse and a prop warehouse, and these change constantly. So when you leave here, you've been working on sound stages just like in the real movies. As undergrads or grads, you can take directing, and you see we have green screens, which you saw some of in the web series. And, and you can take producing, which again, the difference between directing and producing is one arranges for everything to happen and one orchestrates everything happening. But you see, we work with full crews. Our crews on thesis films is just 30 people. Um, you can take cinematography and we have state-of-the-art cameras. You're gonna see some of them tonight. Um, we, we train people to be steady cam. We train people. We have a very active drone program. We're one of the full, first universities in America, at least, to have an underwater drone as well as above air drone. We also make sure our drone cinematographers get licensed so they can go out and do it legitimately. We have a production design program where you actually are working on festival and thesis worthy films. And we have an editing program where you're going to learn to use the state-of-the-art equipment and all of the special effects editing and VR editing, documentary editing, which is extremely helpful not only in documentaries, but in reality TV. So by the time you leave here, you're ready to go and edit in the real world. We have a very active screenwriting program. And of course, we have a very active acting program. So no matter what your area of interest is, you will be able to pursue it here at AAU. So I will take questions about all of this later, but right now what I'd like to do is introduce Bruce, who is going, uh, Melissa Seidman, I'm so sorry. Melissa Seidman and Phil. So what we've done is we've prepared a script for you all. And throughout the evening, we're gonna light this script, we're gonna production design this script, and we're gonna shoot this script. So um, we don't have live actors, we don't have a lot of time to perform the script, but Melissa and Ken are gonna do a read through for you. So as we're lighting it and production designing it, you can keep in mind what the script is. And Kathleen, I believe, has sent you out a copy for those of you who wanna follow along. But what's really important is you just get the sense of it. So when we're talking about moods and the lighting and everything else, you know what that film is. So Melissa and Ken, take it away. <clears throat> um, Stuart, are you, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, sure, I'm fine. Okay, good. Well... I had a I had a really nice time. Yeah, me me too. 
Of course, you know, I've always had a really, really nice time with you. Same here. But. Yeah. I mean, you understand. Uh. You don't hate me, right? No. Because, you know, I could never hate you at the same time, you know, I just don't think I could ever, I mean, you know, in a way that you just, you should be. Yeah. And deserve to be. Uh huh. Okay. Do you feel, do you feel better now? I'm sorry. Me too, yeah. It's, you know, Stuart, it's really good. We have this talk. Yeah. Yeah, before things, you know, they went too far, you know, got too serious. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm too serious. No, you're not. It's, it's me. Uh, okay, it's you. Because the thing is, I just want to do what's right, okay, for both of us. I spent a lot of time examining my heart, and I felt you deserved my honesty. Yeah, thanks. Because I, I mean, I was afraid we wouldn't be able to be friends anymore. <laughs> oh, Joy. In fact, here, I wanted to show you something I got for you. Open that up. Oh, my God, Stuart. This is, this is beautiful. Thanks. It's a it's a Gainsport reproduction. I I seriously I love it. I just love it. Yeah, it's it's pretty special. It really it means something to me, and I'm always gonna treasure it. Now no, as a, as a token. no, you won't, because this is for the girl that loves me, the girl who cares for me, for who I am, not what I look like. I wanted you to know what you'd be missing. You think I don't appreciate art. You think I don't understand fashion. You think I'm not hip. You think I'm pathetic, a nerd, a lard ass, fatso. You think I'm shit. Well, you're wrong, because I'm champagne, and you're shit. Until the day you die, you, not me, will be shit. You don't want dessert? <laughs> well, just a little bit. So guys, I guess you figured out this whole scene is about the gentle dump and the counter dump. So now we'll move to Bruce and we'll talk about how to light this scene. So as you can see here, we've built a little one six scale set. Um, Janet talked about all the beautiful Welcome again um, to create sets and stages that we have Bobby Brill. on camera. In this on episode, we get deep into documents. Sorry. Jenna has told you about all the beautiful um, sets we have on stage. Uh, I'm not on stage right now, so I built you a little beautiful one six scale set right here. Um, the first thing that we usually do when we go to, to light a set is we figure out where the source light is gonna be. So I'm gonna show you how to light this set for day first, and then we're gonna talk about the scene that we're doing here. So if we come and we light this set for a day, one of the first things we can do is we can turn on a source light. You can see that source light coming through the big, beautiful window. I'm going to do a little screen share with you here so you can see that a little better. Ah, look at all that beautiful source light that's coming through the window. So the first thing that I usually do on the set with my gaffer and my electricians is I go fishing. What I do is I go fishing for the right angle of this beautiful source light. So I want a, a source light here that will give me a lot of reach into the room. Okay. So I've got this source light. This could have been, could be a 10K if we're on stage or a 20K, 20,000 watt light. This is a 200 watt light because we're at scale. And then I might want to think about the color of this source light. How do you like that? So what if we make this source light a little warm and a little beautiful, a little golden like that? So you can see that we have the source light. 
source light is going, coming through the window. It's giving us a really beautiful um, feeling of daylight on the wall. Now, we use these things called backings um, in the industry. They're photorealistic backings and with them for day and for night. If you light them from the front like this, you'll see that it looks like New York City during the day. So look how amazing that is. So not wanting to go to all, the, all the way to New York City, look what we have right there. And we have backings like this at school where we can, we can show a realistic background. When we light it from the front, it's for daylight. When we light it for the back, it's nighttime. These things are wonderful for working on the sound stage where you have control of sound and lighting and electricity and heat and air conditioning and parking and, and all the wonderful things that we can do in a sound Bruce, stage. Bruce, somebody's asking, is source light the key light? Source light is not necessarily the key light. The key light is usually the most important light on the set that is illuminating the actor. And sometimes the source light is the key light when the actor is in the source. Um, sometimes there's other key light. In this particular, that's a really good question. In this particular situation, we're gonna do something called back cross key lighting, which is that if you look up here, there's a, there's a, a, a cross light, a back cross light right here for our actor here. And there's a back cross light right here for our actress. And when the lights are, are set up stage like this, they're called back cross key. So let me turn on those back cross keys and you'll see what they look like in the actor's face. So you can see her back cross key just came on. The beauty of this technique, this back cross key technique is you're back lighting the gentleman on the right and you are front lighting our actress on camera left. He gets the inverse, same thing. He gets a nice light in his face over here. And these would be considered the key lights in this particular situation. So she gets a nice, beautiful key light here. See it in her face. She gets a nice, beautiful key light over here. Oops, you can see we're seeing off the set. When we see off the set, sometimes we have the grips fly in a wall. We call that a wild wall, okay? so. She gets a back cross key, he gets a back cross key. There's very few lights that are, that are on in the set right now, okay? She gets illuminated really beautifully, he gets illuminated really beautifully. And the way that these upstage keys are is you're not gonna get a boom shadow from this key. You're not gonna get a boom shadow because the light is upstage. So that when you put a boom in there. Bruce? Yes? Could you... Uh tell our viewers the difference between upstage and downstage? Sure, upstage is away from you. Downstage is towards you. Upstage is away from the camera, okay? So when you put a boom into this, thank you, Ken, when you put a boom into this, you can see that my finger is going where a boom is, you see no boom shadows because the, because the light is coming from upstage. So this is really a wonderful technique that's used in the film business a lot. Now, you might say this all is fine and good for a daylight scene, but how do we turn this into night, okay? So one of the things that we do to turn this into night is of course we turn off the, we knock down the sunlight. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna knock down the sunlight um, right here. I'm going to throw some wire into this right, right here. I'm going to take off the gel. I'm going to knock down the intensity of this light. And I'm going to make it nice and cold. Now, moonlight is blue. So I'm going to make this light nice and cold, turning this from day to night. So that feels a lot more nighty for me. I'm going to turn off our backing light our front light, and I'm gonna rear light that backing. Because as we said before, when you backlight it, it appears to be night. And when you front light it, it appears to be day. 
So look how interesting that backing looks onto the window. I'm gonna take it and put it right in there a little bit better. Pretty interesting, huh? A lot so Bruce, somebody's asking if you'll pan out for a second to see the lights. Sure. You want to come out and see where these lights are? Like that? So as you can see, this light right here is the moonlight source. Okay. This light right here is the upstage key for this actor. Okay. Maybe you can see it better if we get at the, at the light. You see, this is the upstage key for the actor. Okay. So one of the cool things about what Bruce is doing, uh, even though he's working in, in a very small area as in miniature, all of the rules of lighting apply. All the physics of light apply exactly the same. So one of the other wonder, thank you, Ken. Um, actually, we've learned that, that um, although it's fun to be on the set too, we can also learn quite a bit from working in miniature. Um, one of the things that we would do in this environment, whether it was a, an actual set or whether, um, whether it was on stage or a practical environment, is we would use practicals to make things work. So let's add a little source light, a little practical light right here. Hey, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, first of all, you got to make sure people know what a practical is. Practical is that chandelier that we just turned on behind. Okay. So a practical means a light that the audience can see in the room as opposed to a movie light, which we don't want the audience seeing. Yes, now, that's on camera somebody light. Somebody else wants to know, does the temperature of the lights matter when changing from day to night as in color ten temperature? Yes, they do. Color is one of those wonderful things that you can use to your advantage artistically. So that's why we've used the blue light for the moonlight, as opposed to the, to the yellow light that we started with for day. And we're using a warm um, practical, that, that light that's, that's um, emulating a chandelier, so that when you have that warm golden color and that cool, it, it sort of makes the blue moonlight stand out. You can also see that the backing uh, is, is very blue. Um, one of the other things that we like to do is we can emulate that source. Maybe we don't feel that that source light is strong enough. This light right here is set up, um, this is a pattern projector and we use pattern projectors on stage. This pattern projector will actually throw a pattern that will give you the feeling like a chandelier. Let's turn it on and see what it does. See that? So one of the great things that we learn how to do in our lighting classes is we learn how to emulate light sources. We learn how to back cross key light. We learn how to light stages and sets and practical locations for day and night. And we learn how to shoot on film. We learn how to shoot on, on digital. And uh, we have our own telecine operator and we shoot quite a bit of film, 16 and 35. And Ken and I and Rich and Ellen um, love to teach you all about cinematography. What color gels would you use and what placements would you stage them for a sunset effect? For a sunset, that's a, that's a very good question. Let me see if I have some that's sitting right here. Obviously, we, we didn't even rehearse this. So here's some gel. Um, what I like to use for sunset, it's usually three quarter O or apricot. So if we were to take, if we were trying to, if we wanted to make this a date of, of dusk scene, what would we do? Okay, we would take some of that. Let's take some of this apricot for starters. Let's put my my gloves on because I wouldn't be a very good instructor if I didn't put my gloves on. And let's pull some wire out of this. Sweeney over here. Okay. 
out very carefully. We're going to take the blue gel off of here very carefully. Add some orange gel to make dust. Now, the angle of the light is very important. Light is about quantity, quality, color, and direction. Dust light is usually very low in the sky. So let's talk about making this light very low. So if we make this light very low, like it's the sun coming across the horizon, and we put it into the room like that, Is that starting to feel more like dusk? Looks that way to me. Excellent. So that, what do you do about the New York night outside when it's dusk? Because it looks like full light outside. We do the Just same full thing. Night. We play with it a little bit until it gets a little warm out there. Maybe we add a little bit of the daylight to it. Or maybe we add a little bit of that same dust gel to that kind of source like this. That works. So color and light and camera are so much fun. And I've been enjoying doing it for decades. I've been enjoying doing television shows for years and years and years. And now I'm loving teaching it on stage. So one of the good things about our sound stages is we are able to do full scale backing and create any environment. So Chris, why don't you jump in and talk about set decoration for a minute or two okay. or 20. Okay. <laughs> All right, fine. Let me turn on my video. So Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's really exciting sharing all of our love of filmmaking with you and looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible in our upcoming semesters. And um, just let me interject, for those of you who are more camera than production design, we're going to come back to shooting after we talk about production design. However, I'm also going to talk about the collaboration that goes on between camera and lighting and the art department, because it's very critical. Um, many of the things that you just saw on Bruce's miniature set involve items that are provided by the set dresser and the set decorator, and also um, the production design and building of the sets. So when you saw shadows on the walls, sometimes those are created by existing window moldings, and sometimes they will be enhanced by um, structures that are provided and used by grip and electric. When we have the um, shadows from the sheer curtains, those are very important also provided by uh, set decorator and they will use shears to diffuse light and then they will use curtains to obscure the lighting that's coming in from outside. Um, other things that are provided by set decorations are the furnishings that you saw. Actually, um, the wallpaper uh, was sent down to Bruce. He installed it in his set. Uh, there were rugs that maybe you didn't see, but they're there just in case we see the flooring. Practical lighting, which Bruce talked about. So practical lighting is going to be any sort of lighting sources. They can be strings of lights in your dorm room. They could be wall sconces. They can be chandeliers table lamps, floor lamps. And if you're doing a movie that takes place before electricity was invented, then your torches on the wall, your bonfires, your um, fireplaces, all of those are also considered practical lighting. If you're going along looking through the cave for the missing link, you'll use a flashlight. That's a practical light. So practical lights are on, on camera. And what they do is somebody asked the question, well, you know, what about the practical lights? Uh, you know, what, what are they considered? Well, they motivate the lighting that is then uh, supplemented by our lighting department. So some directors and DPs use practical lighting like nobody's business. Sometimes they use candlelight. So candles can be very, very important. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So I have a little... Uh, PowerPoint to share with you, and it's based 
partially on what we're discussing and also what we're doing with the uh, script that you just heard our uh, colleagues, Melissa and Ken, um, perform for you. So this is going to be um, a little moment here. Can you see this? It says production design. It's kind of teal blue. Do you we see can. that? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So in this, we're going to have a conversation with the production designer and the director, and they're going to talk about the script because the production designer maintains, creates and maintains a visual style or look for any project. So they're going to discuss things. They're going to discuss who the characters are. What's the story about? So were any of you thinking about Joy and Stuart while the scene was being performed? I mean, we really have to ask questions. Who are these people? You know, how long have they been together? When did they meet? Why are they breaking up? And so many more questions. So then we start talking about the styles. It seems like it's Joy's home. Does she have something like this, which would be kind of traditional and classical and quite frankly, possibly boring? Or maybe she is venturing into the modern or mid-century style that is so popular, especially with a lot of our money earning techies these days. Perhaps industrial design. She's taken over a loft space. I know it's everybody's dream. Unrealistic in this day of high rents, especially in the Bay Area. Or maybe she goes a little kooky and likes K-pop and a lot of color. Or who knows, she could be venturing into steampunk, which takes us in a completely different direction. Now, we're going to look at a few styles, three styles. Let's take it down that the director wants to look at three particular styles. An industrial loft makes sense. We could be in New York. We could be in San Francisco. We could be in Chicago. We could even be in places around Europe and maybe even Asia. So we have the industrial loft space, very cool for a 30 something actor or character in their story. And it is appropriate for, we have a dining scene. So we wanna look at tables and seating for the dining as well as notice things like our practical lighting. Maybe the kooky, if we were in San Francisco, we could think about the neighborhoods where our young lady lives, where Joy lives into high color. We almost know what kind of music she likes just looking at these pictures. And it can get pretty wild with colors and patterns. It gives a whole different interpretation of her character. Or perhaps we can look at something a little more contained, like shabby chic is what we call this, okay? And looking more specifically at our shabby chic, we can talk about something like romance, flowers, pastels, lace, and keep thinking about these possible styles when we're talking about our character, Joy, what are her emotions like? Remember, what is she doing? She's breaking up with this guy. So which one of these settings is really going to be most appropriate for her and her character? Here are a couple of shots of possible dining rooms. Now, this shabby chic style tends to be fairly light. And generally, when we're looking at color palettes, we try to avoid white, white, and black, black, and super saturated colors, because cinematically, they don't work really well. Doesn't mean you can't have an all white set, but you better know what you're doing. So we're going to look at what best describes our young Joy and her home, where she's going to have dinner with unfortunate Stuart. Another couple of possibilities. Notice that we see chandeliers in most of these pictures. We have themes that are going on. We have candles. We have dried flowers. We have somewhat um, aged furniture. Here's practical lighting, okay? So we're gonna look first at some chandelier styles. We try to show something a little different every time we present choices, but they all work toward the same theme and mood for our characters. We're working toward the same emotional presentation of joy, our character. Wall sconces, more practical lighting. Now you could also have wall sconces or some of this other lighting with candles in them. They would still be considered practicals. Here's floor lamp and table lamp suggestions that could work along with this same style. 
Now the wallpaper that you just saw in Bruce's set was one of these three that was presented. Any one of them could work for our selected shabby sheet style. Window treatments, shabby sheet lends itself toward lace. Lace works beautifully with a little bit of wind going on through the window. It diffuses the light beautifully and it creates amazing shadows on the walls and sometimes the actors. The rugs, these aren't your classic modern rugs. These are more traditional rugs. They're called Aubusson. They're not an oriental rug, but it's a different taken from the French, very romantic. So we're creating this character of joy with curves, romance, a lot of vintage considerations. But again, she's gonna be breaking up with Stuart. So this section is called smalls. In set decorating, there's a category of set dressing that we call smalls, primarily because it's smaller than furniture that they get put on top of. So smalls can be anything from glassware, objects, could be clocks, could be small toys that you have. Like think about your bedroom or where you live or where you are with your parents or your friends. And pretty much everybody has stuff. So instead of saying small stuff, we just call them smalls. You might call them tchotchkes. You might call them bibelots. You might call them knickknacks, okay? We call them smalls. Now, a key prop in the story is, comes in a box, Stuart gives it. He's going to give it to Joy, but he's kind of hesitating because she's just broken up with him. So we wanna look at different types of boxes and ribbons, how are those boxes presented? So there's a lot of different approaches to that. It's not just like, oh, any old box with any old ribbon. And it's gonna also have to fit the ashtray inside. So the center one here also is your classic Tiffany box. We don't know, is Stuart a Tiffany guy? We don't know. We need to know who Stuart is also. And then there's the ashtray. What works as a pewter ashtray? So here we have some choices. Which direction can we go in? Let's see what happens. And there we go with that. I'm gonna unshare at this time. So let's talk about how this would all play into the movie. So right. if we were to decide that Stuart had gotten this for her and we wanted to make it the ultimate loser gift and make her feel like, oh, um, I was right to dump this guy because he's such a loser. You might have a very silly box with a right. very silly ribbon on it. If you want to make it look like, well, Stuart's a guy with a lot of taste and he's gotten her this beautiful thing and it's a really, really bad decision she made, you might do the Tiffany box. Mm -hmm. So these kind of props say an enormous amount about the character. So when we go back to the lighting, what you guys will see is that it's a very um, classy wallpaper. And actually we picked this. Um, we picked a pattern, Chris and I, and we sent it to Bruce to put on the wall so that he could, so that it said something about her. Now we could have gone with the middle one, but we thought too feminine, too frilly. We could have gone with the one on the left, but we thought, ah, a little boring. So we went with the one on the right to say something about her, which is she has taste, she has money, she has class, but not too, too girly. So that was a very, very clear decision. The same with the carpet that Chris and I picked that we sent to Bruce. Um, we again wanted to say something about the character. Which one did we pick, Chris? The middle one. The middle one. Mm -hmm. um, not, if you look at the one on the left, that could be a little hippy dippy and very establishment. One on the right, way too quiet. The one on the left again says I'm a little bit bold. So again, even, all of them could work. Right, but so. even when you're going as small as the carpets, if you are going to see the floor, and you don't always see the floor, but if you're gonna see the floor, it says something about the character. 
And that's a conversation that would also be had with the cinematographer, because if you're going to see the floor, you want a light so you can see the floor. So it's a constant back and forth between the cinematographer and the production designer. And for those of you who are asking who makes these decisions, the director. Mm -hmm. So all of these choices are presented to a director and they make the final decision for every single room and every single prop in a room. And directors will come to the set hours before in order to go, no, change that, change that. I like that. I don't like that. And sometimes with props, the actors get involved. Mm -hmm. If it's a prop that the actor is going to be handing, handling or using, sometimes they'll meet with you, right, Chris? Yes. And so um, it's always important to have conversations with your lead actors to see what their ideas are as well. And they're, because they have to be comfortable with them. They're going to be picking up props, taking them to somewhere else. It's part of their action. It's part of how they track their beats. Um, and so when you present props, you're going to present choices for all the props. And not all of the props are mentioned in the script. So you have to infer things, imply things. You have to know if somebody's married, they better be wearing a wedding ring. Somebody might have eyeglasses or sunglasses. They might have watches, but they might also have, guess what? A wallet with ID and money in it and credit cards. What about prop food, Chris? And now prop food. So here's a whole other conversation. What food, what food is she going to serve her boyfriend when she's breaking up with him? What do you serve the guy you're breaking up with? Got any ideas? Is it his favorite meal? Cause it's basically his last meal. Do you serve red wine knowing that he might spill it all over you? I mean, you gotta anticipate things or do you just like get Chinese takeout and go, well, I don't know. Or is it gonna just be goldfish snacks? And it's like, why spend money if you're not gonna be around the next day? Lots of, lots of thoughts about that sort of thing. And so we ask the director and the director needs to know absolutely everything about the story and these characters. We and then doesn't it get more complicated today because actors could be vegans or vegetarians? Well, this is exactly it. This is, I have this, I'm like, well, what about Joy? Is she a vegetarian? And so we need to see these things, not just on the plates of food, but also if we see into the kitchen, we need to know like what, you know, what kind of coffee does she have in the morning? Is she a drip coffee person? Does she have instant? God forbid, I don't know anybody who has instant anymore. Or, you know, French press, there's all these thoughts. Are, is she a tea drinker? Maybe she's only tea, maybe she's a vegan. And so there's like no eggs or butter anywhere. We don't know. Um, so all of these considerations, the plates that are used, the silverware, um, every single thing you have to think, what is her job? Can she afford? all this lovely crystal that is around on the table or are they you know, drinking out of little tumblers from Target? So we wanna think about everything and it has to make sense to the characters because it's important for the actors, it's important for the director and it's important for the audience because you're gonna get visual clues about the characters. It's almost like playing a game when you're looking at a set you're following the story, you're into the characters, you're into the story and you're going, oh my God, look what they have on the shelf. That's like so perfect. And it gets really exciting when you get feedback from people about what they enjoy about the sets. When so somebody was asking, uh, do the actors actually have to eat over and over again? Oh and gosh, no. No, that's why they have a spit bucket. So if you see a commercial, <laughs> somebody's gonna take a bite and then, they're gonna get rid of it. So we also ask the actors what they in real life like to eat because we don't wanna serve them anything that they don't like. However, it might be that we give them a little bit of a different food and we don't always start with the full plate. It might be like in this case, we have to say to the director, what point of the dinner are they at? Have they finished dinner? Is it just the end of like the, you know, couple pieces of salad, lettuce, and maybe a little piece of tofu or something and a little, you know, bit of gravy or something dotting the plate. 
Um, are, you know, are they on to dessert perhaps? So we wanna know at what point of the meal are they? Or did she just come in with a big turkey and it's ready to be eaten? So we need to know where they are in the meal. And also remember if actors are eating, their voice is not working quite in the same way. You don't want them chewing and, you know, you don't want to do chat and chew. Okay, so they you have to get it at the right place. So somebody asked, does the crew get to eat the leftovers? And the bottom line is sometimes, maybe, well, but oftentimes, especially if it's hot food, yeah. it isn't hot by the time it gets to the crew. You may not want to do it, but I'll tell you, I was on a Francis Coppola movie one time and we had a gigantic dinner scene but it was going to be the end of the dinner. So the crew, not the shooting crew, but the dressing crew, sorry, uh, and the prop crew, we were actually able to eat so that the things like the turkey and the mashed potato bowl and whatever were taken down to a more later in the meal level. So we wow. started big. So they took it away from you, huh? <sighs> Well, now we're going to go back to Bruce and we're going to introduce Rich Cavio. Thank you so much, Chris. That was fabulous. Thank you. Um, and you can monitor the chat and see if people, um, you like somebody asked you about continuity. So you might want to monitor okay, the okay. chat and answer okay. some people. Thank uh, you. So Bruce and Rich, take it away. How you doing? We're doing Bruce? good. Hey. Okay. So I guess it's, uh, it's, it's my turn, right? Yep. All right. Uh, so I want to introduce myself. My name is Rich Cassio, and I am an instructor of cinematography and lighting at the uh, Academy of Art University. Um, I'd like to begin by telling you uh, that there's a lot involved in the process of making a film. It's a process that involves technicians doing many different jobs. Um, today, I'll just concentrate on the position of the director of photography um, or the DP. Um, and the crew of people that work in the camera department. Um, so this will just be a quick abbreviated explanation. Uh, there's so much more involved in making, um, making a film with many different departments working towards one goal, which is to make the direction's vision a uh, reality. If you look behind me here, I have, uh, this is a 16 millimeter um, uh, Airy SR camera, uh, Super 16. And I have a monitor uh, built up on here. Um, and generally what happens is the monitor is used uh, by both the director and the first assistant. Uh, generally what they'll do is they'll pull focus from the, um, from the actor to the film plane, but we can go into that later. Uh, and here I have a uh, Blackmagic Ursa 4K camera with a monitor up here as well. Um, I just will, in my cinematography course, I teach both film and digital video, and we do a comparison of them both. So generally when we're shooting in class, we will shoot um, uh, side by side. And um, when the film gets processed, uh, it comes back to me as a, um, uh, uh, it gets transferred digitally. And then I'm able to show the following week, I'm able to show my film that, that just got transferred to digital and um, the digital rep representation uh, from the 4K camera. Uh, but let's, let's continue here. Um, so um, the cinematographer or the DP is responsible for capturing the script on film or digital video. So the DP must pay attention to lighting and the camera's technical capabilities. He has to know exactly what this camera can do and how it will perform um, for the, Film side, we have to think about um, the uh, film stock, the sensitivity. Um, this is 16. This is 100 foot of 16 millimeter film, um, which will give you about two minutes and 45 seconds. This is a 35 millimeter film. You see the, the thickness of this. Uh, it's a thir actually 35 millimeter wide. Uh, this is 50D, and this is for exterior daylight stock. Uh, this one that I just showed you is reversal. Uh, and it is a black and white reversal. Um, and we can talk about that as well if you have some questions. Um, so um, when the director wants a shot to achieve a, a certain visual or atmospheric quality, uh, the DP will try to achieve this through his or her choice of lighting, 
film stock uh, or digital camera uh, um, uh, using LUTs um, and careful manipulation of the camera. So let's, uh, again, um, we'll have a look at this camera. This has got a, uh, a matte box on it, which holds um, filters. These are four by four filters. So if I need to change the color of the light, uh, or if I need to um, make something uh, look like it's a, uh, later in the day, uh, uh, you can see this, it's not clean, but that is an 85 uh, ND9. Um, and here um, we've got um, the capabilities of, of shooting with this camera. I can shoot um, uh, uh, 1080, uh, 2K, 4K, uh, and I'm able to um, download a particular look uh, to the um, to the film, so so that um, I can achieve a look that this camera, uh, a particular film stock, would use. Like if I were to shoot 50D, which is daylight, uh, which is a, a, a low um, ISO, a low sense lower sensitivity, um, I could achieve that look by shooting this and adding that lookup table, that particular look to the uh, digital video. Um, so. I, I know I'm get I'm going a little uh, a little overboard here. So let's just have a look at the script that was given to me, so I can show you what a DP does um, when he actually gets a script. So here we have. Um, so here's the script. You guys see this? Add to your notes. Yeah. So let's take this out of the way. I don't need that anymore. Whoops, sorry, one more time. So here's the script that uh, you all got a copy of. And what I did was I took my copy and I drew a couple of um, uh, makeshift storyboards so that I would know exactly where I wanted to place the camera. Um, I wanted to uh, decide uh, when the camera was gonna go from uh, uh, a, um, an establishing shot to a uh, two shot um, to an over the shoulder and to a single. Uh, and I also had to find a place in which the camera would, could be set up for um, a master shot, which is the, sh the shot from the, the entire scene from beginning to end um, in, in one spot. And what we would do is we would cut in these shots, the, uh, the over the shoulder, the inserts, the cutaways. Um, so uh, I marked it all up and these numbers coincide with the actual um, uh, storyboard frames. So here's the actual storyboard. Uh, and you'll see that here um, we've got the establishing shot. And then what I've done is I we cut to the master shot that I've just described. So now I'm gonna ask Bruce um, to uh, show us a couple of these shots. We're, I want We're gonna look at this shot, the establishing, uh, the master, and then I wanna look at a, a couple of over the shoulders and a single. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll ask Bruce to uh, bring us to the set. Okay, Rich, let's see what we got here. So here we are back on the set, just for a moment before we before we get to, to your favorite shot, I wanted to, to just say that that when we were talking about the floor and we were talking about the rug before, um, this might give you a little better idea of what we were talking about down there. On the That's floor a beautiful the table, Bruce. Say again? That is a beautiful table. Thank you, Rich. And you chose white so that it would do what? Um, white is a, is a wonderful thing sometimes on the table so that so that when you're illuminating that table, some of that light bounces up from the table onto the actor. Sometimes that's a beautiful technique. You can see when I'm, when I'm scrimming the light off of the table that there's less bounce in the actress's face. Here's, the, here's how it normally is. And this is if we flag the light off the table. Okay. So is there a particular shot you would like me to illustrate, Rich? Were you saying that you, was this sort of a, sort of a, a wide 50-50 that you had in mind or? Yeah, wh what I wanted to do is I wanted to show, um, let's show the master shot. So this shot is the, the, um, the entire uh, um, 
three pages, which is basically like three minutes, it's a minute a page, uh, is gonna be shot this way for our first, um, um, it's called a master. And what we'll do is we'll look at that, we'll make sure that it's set up properly, and then we'll go to the over the shoulders because these other shots are going to be cut into this master. So if you can set us up with a, a, a decent master so that we're kind of centered on the table a, a little bit, a little bit more. Okay, well, I'll be your camera operator, Rich. Thank um, you. And you. And you talk to me about, about height and about um, focal length and so forth. I came down a little bit just now. Yeah. Centered that table. Okay, guys, one sec. What's the difference between a master shot and an establishing shot? Okay, so an establishing shot, um, what it does is it brings the viewer in to, um, uh, to the location, to where the film is taking place. Um, a, a lot of times when you see a film, you, you're always seeing a, a shot from way up above the earth or, or up in the sky and, it, and the camera just comes down, it comes down and then it lands somewhere. And what that establishing shot did was to one, bring us into the story um, because it tells you this is the beginning of the story and it shows you where the action is taking place. Uh, that's an establishing shot and it doesn't really, it doesn't usually last that long unless it goes through the title sequence. Um, now, a master shot is a shot that is gonna take place within a scene. So the three pages that you all had the opportunity to look at um, is, is this one scene that takes place inside and there's dialogue between these two characters. What we'll do is we'll shoot it like this. And, and this master is gonna be something that we're always gonna refer back to. We're always gonna come back to the master. So we're gonna end up with an over the shoulder and we'll see that in a second. And then a reverse uh, over the shoulder from her perspective, we'll be looking at him. Um, and then we'll go to singles. And then what we'll do is we'll take all that, all those separate shots and cut them into the master. And, and the editor does this to establish a pace. Um, and it also uh, will hammer down uh, the dialogue. As the dialogue gets more intense, um, we may end up moving closer and closer to the subject until finally we've got a, a really tight shot uh, giving the audience uh, uh, that emotional uh, a feeling that the, that the actor is, is, that the character is going through. I hope that answered your question. So singles, are, somebody just wants to know the difference between singles and over the shoulder. I think we're going to show you that now, right? We're going to show you that. We're going to show you that right now. So, so here's a 50-50 for starters. Okay. Uh, we might have we might have done something like this for geography too. Okay. I think that's kind of an interesting shot to sort of show geography, especially because it's her place. Okay. And then. Rich, you had said that you wanted to, to look at some overs. So yes. if you're going to be over him to her, then we would probably slide the camera like this, and we would probably tighten up our focal length quite a bit. Let's see. OK, so the difference between a single and an over the shoulder is an over the shoulder includes a piece of the other actor. So you see the shoulder of the guy? So that's an over the shoulder. Can you tighten up for a single, Bruce? Yeah, I sure can. A single does not include the other actor. And they make different statements about the emotional feel of the moment. So this is what the other actor is seeing, right? That's what the guy is seeing. He's not seeing over his shoulder. He's just seeing her face. So they make very, very different emotional statements between this and over the shoulder. So there's the single on her. And sometimes as we move in for tighter shots, we're going to change the lighting just a bit because uh, the lighting for the wide shot um, lights the entire set. Uh, not the wide shot of the master. It's going to light the entire set. But as we move in a little bit closer, especially for a single, we might want to add an eye light. Uh, or um, uh, if you look at, so we have a window behind, um, uh, what's her name? Behind the, the, the woman uh, actress. Um, we might want to uh, 
give her just a little kiss of light, um, a little bit extra on uh, around uh, the top of her head and her shoulder, just to separate her from the background. But we want to make it look as natural as possible. There is a light, there's a window already there. So, um, uh, so you're thinking that she needs a little bit more backlight? Just a, just a tad, because when you go in for a close-up, because we're going to have a reaction shot, right? Uh, because he, he tells her that it's not for her and it's for somebody you know that loves him. We want to get a reaction shot. And when we do the reverse, when we do for, uh, the, the single of him, as we move, move closer to, um, to what he says to her in the end, like you know he's telling her that it, this is for someone who, who, who loves me, um, we're going to go a little bit tighter to show um, uh, his expression. And, and if you look, uh, we've got a, a window light um, to his right side. So we could add a little tiny bit of light there. Um, this wall sconce is gonna give him an eye light. So um, we might even just play with it a little bit and give it a little more if we need to. Um, and that's what we'll do is uh, when we move the camera around, sometimes we do things like we cheat, we cheat. Cheating is basically, uh, let's say that she's sitting too low in her seat when we shoot uh, the over the shoulder. Uh, what we'll do is we'll put our phone book under her butt and lift her up a little bit, or we'll shift the table around a little bit. Now you see, um, uh, uh, Bruce has taken that wall away. So um, uh, what he'll do is take the wall away from behind the actress. Uh, Here's my wild wall. That's the grips to fly in the wild wall. Now that, that wall exactly. is a great thing to have out when you were shooting that geography shot. Exactly because you have a perfect shot for the camera. And then if we want to come around for his side, for her, over her to him, then we fly that wild wall in, right? Exactly. Um, so I, can you do me a favor? Um, can you show me a, a, a first an over the shoulder of her looking at him and then um, move in for a tighter shot? And, and let's show them about how um, we, we give a uh, nose room. We give that room for each character um, so that when the audience looks at the, the, the close up, the medium close up, or the close up, um, there's a space to one side of them. Um, and that empty space um, gives the impression that she is actually looking at someone and they're just on the other side of the frame. Um, so I'd like to look at that. And then I I'd like you to demonstrate by. Uh, how it looks when you put her into the center of the frame. Um, and uh, you can see the difference in why we do it with a little bit of, of, of we call it nose room. Is that what you call it, Bruce, down there in LA? Lead room. Lead room, uh, we call it nose room. Yeah, lead room, nose room. I think we're talking about the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So let's see what we're doing here. I'm gonna do a little, make sure we have focus here. Okay, so now you see that she has a little bit of lead room this way, right? Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's the, the, the over the shoulder. Then um, I want to go a, a single and then put her on, you know, give her that lead room. Okay, so here's the over. And now we're going to, now we're going to come over here. Here's a more drastic over. I kind of like overs like this. Actually. That's a nice over the shoulder. I like that. Yeah, yeah. that's better. Um, and then... Let's uh, let's make sure she's sharp. So Hayden, while they're moving the camera, no, generally you only shoot one camera at a time because you want to be really, really careful you're not shooting the other camera. So that's why it takes so long to shoot a movie is because you're shooting this one at a time. And as you see, we're moving the lights every time. So it takes shooting this scene would probably take an entire day. Um, I, I'd also, that was a good question. I'd also like to mention that um, they do use many cameras occasionally, uh, especially if, um, uh, uh, because time is money and they need to move as quickly as possible. So for this, if we had two cameras, we could actually shoot in, uh, over the shoulder and then we could go slightly to one side to show a two shot and not show that camera. 
Um, there Actually, are TV shows that were done in the past. One of my favorite was called The West Wing. And that was uh, a one camera show. And as a matter of fact, the director of photography won all kinds of awards um, um, every year because he would shoot this amazing show with one camera. Um, in any case, so, so here we have our, our actress in the center of frame. Now, um, this isn't exactly the best way to show this, this person uh, because when you, you see someone see in the center of frame, like it, it almost looks like they're, they're speaking to the, the audience, breaking that wall. Um, this is how we want to do it. it we could even, uh, you could even push in a little bit more for that reaction shot. And we see that, that, that room to um, uh, where she's looking, we've got that space out in front of her. That space is, the, the, the other actor is just on the other side, just on the other side. And her eye line is always um, in the proper position. Now, sometimes when we shoot the shot, there may not be enough room so we will actually move the actor um, away from his spot, pull the chair out and have him stand just over the camera so that he can still act and feed her lines and she still has the proper eye line. Um, that's another way that we cheat. Um, that looks great, Bruce. Um, uh, My pleasure. Very, very nice. It's always better, Olivia, for the actor. A stand-in will never give the same emotion. All right, so uh, uh, Bruce, there's um, so there's our single, uh, and um, let's just do one more thing. Sure, and, um, what would you like? So for this shot, uh, do, do you have something that you can give her a little bit of, a, of an edge on her, her back and shoulder and hair? Sure. Um, do you have something handy that, we, just, just to give her a little separation? That the wall is beautiful. You've got that really nice look in the wall. Uh, it's very contrasting. It's really pretty. It's, um, it looks You're looking for a little bit more backlight on her, right? A little backlight on her. And if you notice, when you look at this frame, um, think about what your eye, see, what where your eye automatically wants to go. Like for me right now, I mean, I see her in the frame, but the back wall is like almost a stop over what she is. So I'm automatically looking at that wall, at that big white spot, those spots in the wall. So I, I, I don't want that. I wanna be able to look at her. I want, I want my audience not to be looking around. I want them to look exactly where I tell them to look. I'm the sheep herder and, and the audience is the sheep. I make them look where I want them to look. I make them go where I want them to go. That's what a DP does. And uh, the gaffer and the DP are like this. Um, they know what each other needs. They know uh, how uh, the gaffer already knows what the DP wants. He, he tells him, this is how I want to shoot this between an F2 and 2.8. Um, and I want to make sure that my actors are always a half stop uh, over everything else in the room. Um, so, so you see how she's become brighter, folks. Now, somebody wants to talk about the effect the height of the camera has on the emotion of the scene in a close-up. That that's a, a great that's a great question. Let's, um, let's, if, illust let's illustrate it. So, so what happens if we get really low? And we uh, right, and we look up at her. Now, now. This is, um, this is like the last shot, only the camera is slightly down below and looking up at her, right? So she, if, if you look at the scene, um, she would be the boss. She's, she's the person that we're looking up to, she's in charge. If you were to take the camera and move it to the other side and we looking slightly down at the, at the male character, then that solidifies that. That solidifies the fact that she's in charge, she's the boss, and she, um, uh, uh, well, in the beginning of this, of, of this scene, that's probably how we would shoot it. Because if you look at the script, the screenplay, she's actually breaking up with him and, and she's all, well, you know, this was all great and you're a swell guy and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we should be looking slightly up at him. So we know that, uh, I mean, down at him, excuse me. Uh, so we know that he's sort of subservient to her. Like that, Rich? 
I, yeah, and then um, just put them a little bit more uh, to the right on the frame, just a tad. There you go. Uh, so guys, what what I want for those of you who aren't filmmakers, and I yet, and I apologize to those of you who are. That's why you shoot the master, because then you shoot all these other little shots that are establishing emotional keys and clues. And then you edit them in a rhythm that sets the rhythm of what's going on in the scene from an emotional point of view. And then that's the up and the down and all these other things and even the lighting. And so the director works with the cinematographer and then with the editor to be able to deliver all those emotions from all these many shots. And for the, whoever asked about, do the actors have to match their action? Yes, sometimes 20, 30, and 80 times in the same scene. So it's, it's very hard for actors to be able to um, sometimes eat the same meatball 80 times for all the different camera angles you just saw. Um, and there's all this matching that has to go on that somebody named a script supervisor is in charge of. So Ken, Mr. Farrow. Yeah. So Ken, for one moment, is gonna to talk to you guys about the 9 million um, camera crew positions, because right now you've seen just one Mr. Finn working with just one Mr. Cassio, when in fact there'd be six, seven, eight people doing this. So why don't you talk about that? Yeah, um, so this is, this is really fantastic that we have the ability, uh, especially in this quarantine times, uh, to collaborate and light a set this way. Um, and we, we have one person doing virtually all the jobs uh, where we have uh, hopefully very soon uh, the ability to have many more people doing the jobs. And I wanna talk a little bit about some of the jobs that are um, out there that um, we have, let me find that real quick. That's not it, where did that go? Are you going to go back to, are you sharing screen? He wants to do his chart, but Ken, why don't you just talk? Yeah, so what, what happens, why do not my video is, oh, there it is. Um, so what happens is the, the camera crew isn't just one person. Um, the uh, entire camera crew represents one corner of the tripod. There is also the grip department, and there is also the electric department. Now, Bruce has been acting as sort of grip, electric, and camera all in one. But really, we, there's at least 12 jobs that are available to the uh, person that works in the film business in camera, electric, and grip. So I'm just going to break those down really quickly. Uh, the grip department is the people that move things. They build stuff, they push the dolly, they, um, they set up what are called C-stands, uh, and they, they put up things called nets and flags. But and what let's they do be clear, Ken, that's only in the camera department. There's still all the people who move things in the art department, too. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there, are, there are loads of what I call entry positions uh, for people to get into the movie business um, with a little bit of experience. Uh, you can work in the art crew, you can work in the camera crew, you can work uh, in the electric crew or the grip crew. Um, and these jobs require a whole host of different skills. So part of our program is really set up around that very idea in which you're going to learn the greatest, coolest aspect of being in the business, which is to direct, uh, which is to be the director of photography, but you're also going to learn all of those entry level positions. Those are the jobs that get your foot in the door. Um, my first job in the movie business was craft service. I cut up snacks. 
Um, every one of us has some story about being in uh, some entry level position on a movie set. Francis Coppola drove trucks. James Cameron drove trucks. So what we want to do is we want to train you to be of use in a bunch of different skill sets. When we come back uh, to regular production, um, we're probably going to work with much smaller crews and the crews are going to need to be cross-trained. So that's part of the focus. So you'll notice that uh, uh, Mr. Cassio has on his resume, he's assisted, he's operated, he's a director of photography. Um, you need to have a variety of skill sets in order to be successful. So that's the way the program uh, at the university is set up. In addition, we're looking to get you into the Hollywood unions. Union pictures are the big budget movies that you all know and love. And in order to work in that area, you need to have experience. And a lot of what I do as the chair of the cinematography department is assist students going down to LA in getting those sort of opportunities, uh, getting their union paperwork squared away, uh, helping them navigate through all of that, that sort of stuff. So um, some of our people have asked what a grip is, what an electrician is, what's the difference? Sh sure. Um, so an electrician is the person that puts the lights up and runs power to them. Now, we have battery-powered lights, we have generator-powered lights, we have lights that you plug into your house. Somebody earlier asked, um, do we use just movie lights or do we use practicals? We use a mix of those things. Even the practical lights on set, although they are generally placed by the art department and set decoration, they're generally also plugged in and given power by electricians. All of the power to all of those equipment trucks is done by the electricians. And there's a whole host of jobs in there and I won't get into the tall weeds. My right hand on the set, uh, every director's right hand on set is the gaffer. And the gaffer actually runs the lighting crew. Um, now there's also things that are put in front of lights. Uh, a lot of what you're seeing, uh, what Bruce did today on his set you notice all those lovely little patterns on the walls, all the little uh, shadows, all of that. Those are placed there very, very specifically by the grip crew, uh, usually under the direction of the director of photography or the gaffer, but all of those things move together. Now, if Rich was the operator on the show, he may say- What's an operator? Ah, the operator is responsible for maintaining proper framing and composition throughout the entirety of the shot. It sounds easy, but it is by far one of the most difficult jobs to do on the set. Because so that's not the cinematographer's job? No, the cinematographer is the director of all the photography. The operator is the person that actually pans and tilts the camera. Um, it's a very physical job. Uh, it requires the ability to get down low and get up high to be able to climb, uh, sometimes to wear special equipment. Um, if you're a steady cam operator, you saw some in our clips. Um, handheld is very physically demanding. These are all things that are usually done by an operator. Um, actually, wouldn't you say, Ken, that uh, it involves a lot of trust for the DP um, to give to one person. So it's usually Ab an operator. Absolutely. Uh, trust. Uh, there also needs to be trust with the director. The director needs to be able to know that the operator can execute their vision the way uh, they want it executed. All right, so somebody asked an excellent question. What's the difference between a director of photography and a cinematographer? There is no difference. The, the, they're, just uh, different terms for the same thing. Uh, oftentimes they're called the camera person. Uh, I know it's a bit confusing, but the uh, traditional camera crew consists of a director of photography, a camera operator, a first assistant, a second assistant, a loader or media manager, okay? 
Now there's other jobs like the director, uh, digital imaging technician, which actually uh, sort of does a color correction job in concert with the DP. Uh, but the traditional camera crew has all of these people in order to keep the speed on set at its maximum. So you guys saw how many shots that this, we didn't go through half of Rich's storyboard, right? And all those shots need to be gotten in a shooting day. And so um, it takes all these people to make that doable. Now, somebody's asking, what's the difference between a focus puller and would it be more automatic with digital cameras? That is a fantastic question. A focus puller uh, is a person that actually shifts the attention of the audience to whatever the director needs it shifted to in real time. And a lot of people will probably say, well, I, you know, I have a great autofocus on my camera or a great autofocus on my phone. Why do we need the focus puller? And the reason why we need a focus puller is the focus puller is a human being that can anticipate a performance before it happens and brings your eyes to the action at exactly the right moment. See, an autofocus can't do that. An autofocus could only say, oh wait, that's out of focus, let me get it back in focus. But it doesn't know when somebody's gonna talk, it doesn't know when you focus on the person in the background even though the person in the foreground is talking. So, so sorry. No, that's, that's- um, Somebody wants to know, are drone operators in demand and is licensing a must? Uh, there is a market for drone operators. Lots of people want to do that job. Um, in the motion picture business, those people are, are well regarded and it's tough to get into. But even if you're working for your cousin's real estate firm shooting footage, you have to have the federal license. Otherwise, you are in violation of the law and you could be fined. So um, does the director with work with the director of photography as they shoot the film or does the DOP have the upper hand in how the film is shot, like the angle in which the camera shoots? No, they get fired. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, the reality is, is that a, a director of photography may have uh, a certain uh, amount of trust or influence with the director, but it is the director's movie. It's always the director's movie. Now there's some directors, for instance, a lot of directors who come from being writers or actors who don't feel comfortable as much with the shots. I direct and I came from producing and writing. So I always find a cinematographer who I can trust with certain things because I have a vision. I actually have a style. I like a lot of moving cameras, but I need my director of cinematography who I can say what I see and then they can come up with suggestions to how to get what I see. Yeah, um, and there are actually what are called director camera people uh, in the commercial uh, sector, which is a very, very viable uh, place to, to look for employment uh, that do both jobs. And Peter Hyams and Steven Soderbergh and other people act as their own directors of photography. Um, but for the most part, a director's got so many things to think about. It's really a benefit to them to have somebody to do the heavy lifting and deal with the camera. And then they look at what the image is and decide whether that's the image that they want or that's the image that they've envisioned. Rich, somebody wants to know the speed of your film stock. Oh, uh, right now, the film that's in there is uh, 160. It's okay. black and white. Um, it's black and white reversal. So Olivia had um, a really great question, which is how do heads plan out a single shot take? So that's a fabulous question, Olivia, because I've done single shot takes through an entire apartment, which is four page scenes. And obviously every single department has to collaborate with that. Because if you're going for four pages, you're gonna to have to put the lights where you don't see the lights. You're gonna, why don't you guys, Chris, do you wanna join in? Why don't you guys talk about how you do that? 
And the thing is, you start early. You don't just make it up on the day. Yeah, so uh, it, a lot of you may know the very famous Goodfellas shot in, uh, in uh, the Copacabana scene that goes all the way through the restaurant. That took three days to shoot. There were two days of placing actors, extras, rehearsals, pre-lighting, doing everything they can to get that scene so that the operator could go through it and make and execute it properly. And that uh, the the oneer shot is the ultimate dance. That's when every person, no matter how small or big on the set, has to execute exactly right. If not, the shot's blown and you start over. So how do we get our film transferred to the digital world? Ah, uh, well, we have um, we have some pixies that no, we have a uh, <laughs> we have a man uh, by the name of Paul Cope who is a professional colorist. He used to work for Photochem in Hollywood, um, and we have our own telecine machine. And the telecine machine takes film that is shot, processed. It is then brought to this machine, which is on campus, and he takes and digitizes it through what's called a 2K spirit. So we can give you a, a 2K film image in both 16 and 35, and we do that pretty much weekly. Can I jump in a second, Ken? Yes, please. So one of the wonderful things about having um, an artist like Paul Cope and our own Telecine Bay is we can turn around our film quickly. So when Ken and Rich and I and Ellen shoot film in our class this weekly, we get to screen it the next week at the same time. We also get to go to the Telecine Bay and have Paul teach us about how to operate a Telecine Bay. And I get to teach and Ken and Rich and Ellen get to teach how a director of photography communicates with a colorist and how to handle sessions when there are producers and directors. And sometimes these telecine sessions can be very politically charged. So one of the things that I love to teach too, I know that, that Rich and, and Ken does too, is some of these soft skills about how to handle these kind of situations. So somebody asked, do you stick to the plan for the shot list? Never. <laughs> um, you always... Start. You sure. always want to give the actors the opportunity to not be breathing puppets. So when you get on a set, you're going to do what we call organic blocking, which is you're going to involve the actors in how the scene is blocked. And then you're going to decide how closely they're following where you saw your shots. And then you may regroup your shots. You may ask the actor to move it's as ken said it's always a dance it's all all long a dance yeah it, uh, the plan is great it's good to go onto a set with a plan because if it doesn't work out you have a jumping off point to to solve problems if you go in and hope for just um inspiration to strike you it's a very expensive way to make a movie and very frustrating. Um, so you start with the plant, but that's like the seed that you put in the ground. And then it grows into the plant that it grows into. And that's where uh, all of your team, your production designer, your director of photography, your script supervisor, uh, and the director are constantly refining the plan moment by moment. And the producer as well. Um, so somebody's asking how long you should ta tailgate um, after to get the actor after the shot to get the actor's natural reactions. Uh, it depends during the course of the film when you see if your actors are great ad libbers. Oftentimes in comedy, you'll tail longer, but when it's cut, it's cut. And sometimes by cutting too early, you lose the best parts of the scene. I did this TV show once, Jenna, where the one actress who was pretty big would say the whole time, I don't understand the scene. I don't understand what I'm doing in this scene. 
And then we would finally finish up the scene and she'd say, oh, I get it now. So somebody wanted to know the iOS for daylight? The uh, ISO? ISO. Yeah. Uh, it depends. There's 50D, there's 250D, um, and um, I think that's the 5285 um, or 7285, which is uh, color daylight reversal. Right. Uh, actually, you can only get that in 16. So uh, Fred wants to know who decides and do you decide on lenses and focal length and what is meant by a long lens. So that again, Fred, that has a lot to do with the director. The director always has the final say in everything. But for instance, again, I as more of a actor's director than somebody who feels comfortable with camera, always see that to my cinematographer, but they'll show me and then I'll approve it. Jack Perez, who's head of our directing department, believes that every director should make every one of those calls. So that's, that's always, again, depends on who the director is. But they also want to know what a long lens is. So could somebody say what a long lens is? Rich, you want to cover that one? Sure. Uh, we have actually two different kinds of lenses. We have prime lenses. We have zoom lenses. A prime lens is going to give you one focal length. So here I have uh, I have a set of prime lenses. I've got 16, 25, 35, 50, 85, 135. So I have a set of lenses. Um, and this is a zoom lens. This lens is going to go from uh, 10 millimeter to 120 millimeter. That is a zoom lens. That has several different focal lengths in between, from 10 to, to, uh, to 120. Um, and Rich, yeah, Rich, yeah. I'm sorry. Perhaps uh, Bruce, you might be able to show us visually what the difference is between the first? between the long lens and a wide lens. Sure, I can do that. Thank you. So let's go back to our little one six scale set for a second. And, and Bruce, when, when you when you go on the long end of the lens, can you explain to them um, about the depth of field, like briefly? Sure, and so, and the question, the original question was, what is a long lens? Yeah. Uh, still photographers like to, like to think that a long lens is somewhere between 85 and 105. The most popular still photography portrait lenses are sort of in that range. Mm -hmm. um, in the movie business, sometimes we're, we're working so fast that long for us might even be a 50. So let's, so, let's see one. <clears throat> so if we look at a lens right here, this is a wide lens. This is probably something equivalent in the 35 millimeter world to a 24 or something like that. As we get into something tight like this, this is probably equivalent to 100 or an 85. So this is what we would consider a long lens. And as you can see, when we, when we come into a longer lens, we, we narrow our field of view. So you are starting wide like this and you are moving into a narrow field of view. You're also decreasing your depth of field. So you're making your- So what's the depth of field? Depth of field depth is, the, is the area that is actually in focus. So as you can see in this tighter focal length, there's limited, there's more selective focus. There's a prettier portrait because the lovely curtains behind our subject are soft, okay? So that gives us a much prettier portrait on a longer lens. If Notice also how it causes the viewer's eyes to go to the subject's eyes. So we're not telling the audience what to think about this character. I'm sorry, what, what we think about this character, but we are telling the audience to think about this character by directing attention all the time. So we're hurting them like sheep. Well, that's one way of putting it, yes. Nice job, thank you, Bruce. Pleasure. So um, I think we'll finish up with one more question because it's a wonderful question, which is what advice would you give yourself as you enter into this career? So each one of you. We'll start with Chris. 
I would suggest be clear on what you like about the profession. And what I mean by that is, do you love, do you have a passion for filmmaking, whether it's for film or television or other media? And then learn as much as you absolutely can. And any opportunity to get experience, whether you're making sets in your home garage or finding other people once we come out of quarantine who are looking for people to help on the weekends to make movies, but also understand storytelling. Do you love stories? Can you tell a story? And can you imagine telling stories visually? Because it's all about visual storytelling. If you don't have a story, you lose your audience. Um, uh, Rich? Um, you got to want it. Uh, if it's something that you want to do, you have to go forward and never, ever stop moving forward. Um, I would suggest, and this is what I did as a kid, I, I really uh, I, I enjoyed photography. So you want to practice photography. Um, you want to look at paintings like Dutch masters. Look at paintings. Look at the way the light falls in the subjects. It's, it's amazing. Once you start looking at these paintings, you're going to understand um, uh, how to create uh, uh, moods and feelings um, and look at the compositions because that's some of the things that you're going to need to learn uh, compositions um, and again I can't stress this um, never ever ever stop uh, uh, feeling like you, you want if you want to do it you need to do it and never look back just keep moving forward because there, there are going to be a lot of obstacles um, and if it's something that you want to do then it doesn't matter what other people think um, my whole family didn't want me to go into uh, filmmaking. They thought it was a waste of time and that I'd be playing games. And, you know, I, I, I had a career doing something else. Um, and um, I didn't feel fulfilled. Uh, I've always been a photographer ever since I was very young. Um, and this is something I wanted to do and I didn't stop. And here I am, I'm doing it. I'm living the life. Mr. Farrow. Oh, uh, I would say three Ps. Proactivity. When you're on, if you get a chance to be on set, learn how things work so that you can anticipate things. Have passion and persevere. This is a tough business. Every one of us has stories of rejection and disappointment, and you just keep showing up. And I'll give you one piece of advice if there is a job that you can do outside of the movie business that you can do, you should do that. But if you're like most of us who are involved in the movie business, if you can do nothing else but be in the movie business, you're in the right place. Chris? I would say to work on creative problem solving. And I'll agree with Rich and Ken that perseverance is really important. Personality is really important. Um, learning how to do things in a cheerful, optimistic way um, and, to, and to fix things happily and to be a leader and to be a communicator um, are really important. And these are all things that we love to teach at school. So I would say, because I'm trained as a lawyer and ran from it, that you have to, I couldn't agree with Ken anymore. You have to be able to eat, leave, breathe. You cannot imagine doing anything else with your life. You're willing to be flat broke and you know working at Starbucks or picking up trash so that you can make movies. I, um, I have been rejected so many times. I've been broke so many times. I left the movie business for five years when I was 50 and couldn't stand my life and came back to the movie business. You must love what you do and you must know as many jobs as possible well so you can help. When you're starting out, the more the higher up people think you are useful, the quicker you will move up. And it's being useful and it's showing passion and ingenuity, as Bruce said, solving problems, 
as Chris said, being available. I've made hundreds of movies and I know who I promote. And I don't necessarily promote the people in the camera crew. I'll promote a truck driver if they have passion and they have creative solutions to problems and they're there when I need them. So all of those things, but you must love, 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 love making movies. That's the biggest thing. It's, it's you eat it, you breathe it, you sleep it. Um, so with that, I think, uh, Hector, we've exceeded our time. Um, so what would you like us to do? Uh, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just send out a few links and some things here and I'll go ahead and uh, just wrap it up. So, hey, so everybody out there, if you don't mind in the chat, uh, let's give a big thank you to the entire team tonight for, uh, for the awesome webinar here. We covered a ton of stuff. I know I learned uh, a lot of different cool things about uh, the film industry for sure. Oh, it was a lot of fun. I was really happy to be here. Thank you all very, very much. I mean, there's a lot of thank yous in the chat here. Pleasure. Great. And great group. Thank you for assembling it. Wow. And anyone who wants to reach out to me, it's jmemel at academyart.edu. And we're here to answer your questions, talk about what's available to you in the fall. We will be open and we will be shooting. So we're here. Absolutely. And uh, thank you for talking about the uh, Goodfellas scene. That's definitely one of my <laughs> favorite scenes ever. Uh, love that. Love that Copacabana scene. So anyway, hey, folks. So, hey, I'm going to wrap it up here because I know there's a lot of people out there and it's it's morning in China. It's super late in New York. If I know we have some East Coasters out there. So uh, let me just bring it home with a couple of words of encouragement for you all. Um, as you can see, there's really just a common theme with pretty much what everybody says here. And it really wraps around being dedicated to what you're doing, loving what you're doing. Um, for me personally, what resonates with me is, is really just effort. I, if you've been on any of these webinars with me, I, I tell everybody this, but if you're coming in as a student, just make sure that you understand that um, effort is going to be one of the most critical components to everything. Um, generally, what you see is the people that make it in, in whatever industry you're looking at and the people that don't, there's usually this huge gap and it's not necessarily talent, but it's usually an effort gap. Um, I know a lot of times people confuse luck with hard work, people confuse you know, good fortune with being like resilient and always putting in the effort. Mm -hmm. All I would tell you is that if you put yourself in the right place at the right time, work your butt off, um, that's the type of a student that we're always looking for. We're looking for the people that, that really just are going to be relentless and want to go after it. We want to teach you from scratch. We want to give you the encouragement and the guidance. Uh, but if you're looking to just get started, uh, I hope that you can see we have a really good program. We have an awesome school. And we have faculty and people that just really care about what they're doing and they really care about their students. So uh, this is one thing I want to do is I want to just invite you uh, to A, if you have not already, you're more than welcome to apply to our university. We are taking applications for our summer semester as well as our fall semester. So we're still working with students enrolling for these upcoming semesters. If you have not already, um, you can also send me an email if you feel like, hey, I just have questions and I want to talk a little bit first. One thing I would do is reach out to me. I can connect you to Jana, to our faculty members. But more importantly, just have a one-on-one. -on -one. one of our things that we like to do uh, in my department is we like to meet with the students up front. And what we do is we just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about what it is that you're interested in, where you see yourself going one day, and try to make sure that this is really a mutual benefit for both of us before we proceed with enrollment. So. You have the application link right there and you also have my email to reach out to me directly. Uh, I run all of the admissions for the university, whether you're an international student or a domestic student, please feel free to reach out to me. For anybody who is in high school, if you're in ninth grade through 12th grade, but you have to be in high school, we actually have a pre-college program where you can take some courses. Uh, so feel free to check that out. I just put the link in the chat as well. And so what I'm gonna do here is, I know that it's getting a little bit late, but I'm just gonna hang back in the chat just to answer any questions individually. 
but I'm, I'm asking everybody, please send me a quick email if you can, so we can open up some dialogue and I can try to help you to get started. So without uh, any more said here, I just want to encourage you all, take the first step. Please try to, uh, while you have the chance, do something that you're going to love. And if you found that this program sounded really cool to you, uh, let us try to help you by getting started and having a nice one-on-one -on -one and we'll see where it goes from there, okay? So thank you all, everybody, for your time tonight. Everybody out there, I hope you have a wonderful evening and be safe. And hopefully we'll see you here tomorrow. Last link I'm going to drop is a reminder that we're going to have uh, a workshop once again tomorrow, and that'll be at 5 p.m. Please make sure to RSVP if you like what you saw tonight. Come on back tomorrow so we can talk, talk a little bit more about acting. So that's enough for me, everybody. Thank you all for your time. Have a great thanks night. Thanks to the panel. You guys were amazing. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bruce, I'm going to call you later. Okay, buddy.